Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino. I'm a psychotherapist, teacher, consultant, and most importantly, a wounded healer, living and working in Chicago, Illinois. On this show, I interview folks in a variety of healing professions, and we discuss the intersectional journey of healing self while caring for others. We're not just focused on individual healing, but also healing on the collective level from white supremacy, late stage capitalism, and the patriarchy. Thanks for joining us. Oh, hello there. Welcome to the dark days of December. It is gloomy outside right now, and I'm very sad about it. I miss the sunshine. I miss it being light after 4.30 p.m., but you know what? I have to continue to remind myself during this time of year that it's always darkest before the dawn, right? And soon after the solstice, we will experience more light each day. I have to keep reminding myself of that. So hello and welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Thank you so much for joining me. I am excited for today's episode and just wanted to chit chat about a little something that's been showing up for me lately. So I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Stutz on Netflix. It's a documentary by Jonah Hill about his therapist And he initially sets out to do a documentary on his therapist, right? And like try to introduce his therapist's tools to the world because they have been really helpful for him. And then what it actually becomes is a more relational experience between him and his therapist. And at the end of the day, what you get to see is a really beautiful representation of a relationship with therapist and client. And that's what I loved about the movie. I absolutely loved seeing the relationship, seeing the honesty, seeing the authenticity, seeing just how real, because, you know, what we've talked about a lot on this podcast is like people's ideas of what a therapist should be and how they should show up and what they should say. But watching this, you see like that therapist is human as fuck and he is silly and he's funny. He's sarcastic and it works for Jonah as a client and it might not work for some other folks, but it really works for him. And I think that's so beautiful. And I've been contemplating what is happening in the world right now in terms of where mental health is and where therapy is going. And something that I think is really concerning is a lack of understanding in the general world about the therapy relationship and just how crucial that is to the healing process. And one example of this is if you listen to any podcasts, you will hear advertisements for better help. And one of the things that they say is that you can change therapists at any time. It's so easy to change therapists. And while I understand that it is really, really challenging to find a good match as a therapist, you cannot just fucking leave your therapist (laughs) if you don't like what your therapist is saying to you. I just, I wish that there were a better way. I know that there are better ways. They're just expensive, right? Like I have this like beautiful idea of, you know, being able to have some sort of like matchmaking sort of company that supports people in finding a really good therapist who has really done their work. And unfortunately, no venture capitalist is going to invest in that idea because they're not going to make any money off of it. And that's, again, we're going back to like capitalism and the commodification of health and wellness. That's also white supremacy. Like it's all fucking intertwined and just makes me so mad. But I really appreciated when I think about that movie, I need to watch it again because there were things that I did not like. I did not like the way that the therapist was representing his tools in that they were like the end all be all. And a lot of it was really stolen from Buddhism (laughs) and he didn't acknowledge that. And that really pissed me off. So there are things about that movie that's not perfect, but what I loved is the relationship. And I, I guess I just wanted to bring that up as something to think about and how, like, what is changing in the way that our culture is, I guess, trying to avoid accountability. Like I talked about this with a client in session today that it's empathy and accountability. I talked about it with a supervisee that 
if a therapist is just validating what a person is saying and helping them feel better, we're not supporting the challenges that come with growth, right? We have to be reflecting back the things that are hard for people to hear. That's our job. And I think lay people don't necessarily understand that and don't necessarily want it. They might say like, oh, that feels bad. I don't want to come back and do that. But the truth is healing sometimes feels really, really bad. But in order to get to the really, really good, sometimes we have to go through that hard stuff. So anyway, that's what I wanted to say about that. If you haven't watched it on Netflix, I wish they were paying me as some sort of promotion for the movie. They are not, but um, go see it on Netflix. Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z, I think. We'll find it. We'll put it in the show notes. Don't worry. So this is the end of the year. And I just wanted to let folks know I am going to be taking January off. I'm going to release little tiny shorties, just like these intros here, but as I've told you, I am transitioning out of head heart therapy into my new business and I need some fucking time to grieve. So that is what's going to happen in January. So you won't get the amazing guests and convos that you're used to, but you will get my voice in your ear for a few minutes in the month of January, the couple of times that we would be releasing an episode. So just FYI, that is coming up. What else do I need to tell you? I'm still on Patreon. So if you are a listener and you appreciate the work that I'm doing and you have any cash to throw my way, it's so appreciated. If you just go to patreon.com and search for conversations with a wounded healer, you shall find me and you can pledge as little as a dollar a month. And you get not only my undying gratitude and love for you, but you will also get a little prize. I send fun things to people when they Patreon me. So just FYI. Okay. On to our guest, because that's what you're here for. You're not here for me babbling alone by myself. So Onyx. Onyx Fuji is our guest today. And Onyx is a queer, non-binary, chronically ill, mixed race, licensed clinical social worker. They're a homeowner and multiple small business owner living and working on unceded Lenny Lenape land, colonially known as Philadelphia, PA. They are a trauma-informed psychotherapist, a clinical supervisor, an intersectionality-focused cultural humility consultant, and the co-director of the Kintsugi Therapy Collective. Please enjoy my wonderful conversation with Onyx Fuji. I'm really excited to share a new offering with you all. Wounded Healers as Leaders is a support and working collective for group therapy practice owners who want to lead from the heart while building a thriving ethical business and step into conscious leadership with courage. Running a group practice is challenging both practically and emotionally. There's absolutely no way to know everything about running a therapy practice. And even though you may be a solo boss, to run a practice, do it well, and maintain your mental health is nearly impossible to do alone. Meetings will be held twice a month with one meeting dedicated to the logistics of running a practice, while the second monthly meeting will be structured as a support group for the emotional components of carrying a business on your shoulders. This group might be for you if you're a group therapy practice owner with one to five years experience and less than 15 employees. For more details and to register, visit tinyurl.com slash wounded healer leaders. That's tinyurl.com slash wounded healer leaders. Hello, Onyx. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. I think I've had a little too much caffeine. So a little like catching my breath to myself. <laughs> but other totally. than that, I'm great. <laughs> so you and I just met for the first time, but you were introduced to me by our mutual friend Asher and you are working with them, right? Yeah. You know, um, Asher and I have been close friends and colleagues for many years, but in the last, I guess, year and a half, we've really become much more connected um, professionally, especially, which I'm sure we'll talk about more today. Yes, absolutely. So let's see, where shall we start? So you are a therapist in LCSW. I am. Yeah. Wonderful. Can you tell us your origin story? I love a good therapist origin story. Sure. It's like a superhero origin, right? <laughs> totally. I also think the question I get asked the most often by like perspective or early into the work clients. And I feel like I should have 
the elevator pitch and I really don't, which maybe is indicative of something about the practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I could credit or blame it on a lot of things like what started me there. I mean, you know, I like sometimes joke, you know, I'm a cancer, I'm an empath, I'm the child of a therapist, I'm a traumatized person for whom therapy has been really life changing. And I also think in a lot of ways, maybe like the sort of like thread that I feel was the earliest for me was just feeling really connected to the idea that connection is our most meaningful and powerful tool as humans and Hmm. seeing that be true for as much of my life as I can remember. And being the child of a therapist, I really tried not to be one actively. (laughs) You know, like I did all the other things one could do. I was doing art things. I was doing service industry things. I got a job working in reproductive justice as a paralegal. And during that time, it just became so clear to me that the part I wanted to do was like the part with the people, not the part with the paper. And that was sort of my nudge towards becoming a therapist and applying to my master's and all of those sort of structural bits that have to happen early on. I love that you were denying your destiny and it found you anyway. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny how that works. Mm -hmm. I have a simultaneous like envy for and fear for people who were children of therapists because it can go one way or the other. I'm guessing that it's never neutral. It's either probably pretty good or pretty rough. And not that I want you to like divulge your whole family history, but I'm just curious how you experienced because we move through the world in a very different way, I think, than quote unquote normal people. And Mm -hmm. since I'm not a parent, it's hard for me to imagine what it would be like to parent and all the things that come up. Anything you have to say about that? I feel like therapists are a big part of my family story. The first therapist in my family was actually my paternal grandfather who oh, wow. was a psychoanalyst and an MD, PhD who came to the United States from Japan to study psychotherapy because in Japan... At the time, there really wasn't as much of a pathway towards a career like ours. So in a lot of ways, I mean, had he not, I don't think I would exist most likely, which is an interesting kind of beginning, beginning origin. And then my mom's mother, who had a high school level education, like many, many years later, when she was a little more financially able, sought education and wound up working in the food stamps office in her state for like a number of years. And then My mom, who was like the first in her family to go to college, wound up pursuing clinical social work. And Hmm. in terms of like, what was it? Maybe it's never neutral. I will say for me, I think having therapists around felt really interesting academically or like intellectually. But I will say, though there were a lot of therapists in my family, like I think in a way, I was the first one to really like be in therapeutic care mm. in a more substantial way. Mm-hmm. And I think that dichotomy has impacted me in ways. Yeah. Like, I think it took me a lot of time to realize there really wasn't separation between client and clinician in the way that maybe I thought that there was or was supposed to be based on what I saw modeled in my family, based on what society, mm-hmm. quote unquote, says mm-hmm. and so on. Right. And I'm guessing it's obviously a generational thing because now, I mean, Gen Z is like, I can't wait to tell you what my therapist said. But I know for my mom, who was a baby boomer, she was terrified of going to therapy. So it's it's changed so much. For sure. Yeah. I have a seven year old and my only guess is that they will like wholeheartedly probably run towards the first opportunity for therapy just because it's become yeah, it's kind of like trending to have a therapist, which I think is great, honestly. But yeah. It is such a different way than folks in our generation kind of were told or were so modeled by our families. Well, and that the whole generational thing kind of leads me to something that I've been talking about with other clinicians. And I have witnessed especially a shift in the pandemic that clients often have an expectation of what therapy is that is much more capitalistic and much more outcome driven that I have ever experienced in my career before. And I was wondering if you see that. Can you say a little more? I think I know what you mean, but I just want to make sure I'm like hitting the mark. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I guess recently I was talking with one of my supervisees who had a client who came in with really specific things that they want to happen as outcomes for therapy. And of course, we as therapists know that, of course, we want to support clients and 
achieving what they wish for themselves. But at the same time, sometimes what we think we want isn't exactly what's going to give us what we're wishing for. It seems like there's a little bit higher demand of I want to feel better right now. I know exactly what you mean. And I certainly have worked with folks who are oriented that way. But I actually don't find that to be the case in most of the people I wind up working with. And I'm sort of struck by like, well, why is that? And the first thing that comes to my mind is that almost, maybe not all, but the vast majority of the folks I work with live with chronic illness and disability and or Mm. mental illness. And so maybe there's a little bit of Mm -hmm. like a kind of leaning in and like a sort of surrender to like, that's not how life works. Like there's no ladder, there's no staircase. And it's more about like trying to be in connection and to create sustainability than it is to kind of move towards those types of achievements. Yes. You know, though that does show up sometimes, you know, and sometimes also like when someone's really suffering, just being like, I want this to stop. Oh, like, I, yes. I don't know how to make it stop. Yes. Do you know how to make it stop? Right. You know, what can we do? I think you hit the nail on the head with the chronic illness piece because there's a level of acceptance that I'm guessing one really just has to adopt because you don't have any other choice. I mean, you do have choices, I guess, to just wallow in misery, but that might not be the most healthful way for people to live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell us about the general population that you work with and why. I would say My clients largely are queer and trans folks, most of whom are BIPOC. I work with a lot of chronically ill and disabled folks. I think over the years, I've come to realize that I am a trauma therapist. And I think that, of course, I am, given who I'm working with. And who I'm working with is really also folks who share community with me. And I think a lot of why I chose to do this work, too, was therapy really did change my life and save my life in a lot of different ways. And I also, in my lifetime, have almost entirely received therapeutic care from cisgender, heterosexual, white women who have provided a lot to me. And and also, I think along the way, I realized it's a really different experience to be able to get care from someone who really can mirror back to you parts of self that often go really disconnected or unseen. And there's just no way to like learn that in the work, right? I think there are some parts Mm -hmm. that can be learned some and I think certainly there's a lot of like power in bridging those divides clinically and not to suggest that because I share X or Y identity with someone that I'm going to get their story. I think it's actually like something I'm really, really thoughtful and careful about, right? Like not over assuming those connections. But I do think for me, like just getting to have The desire to have that like model for me just didn't exist for so long. And so I think a lot of my like push now in doing the work is trying to really provide care towards the communities that I'm a part of that really haven't until very recently had options for care that are even anywhere close to resonant in those ways. I feel like the cultural shift right now is Like there's a simultaneous, I think, kind of um, return to a desire for black and white, right or wrong, yes or no, up or down kind of sort of divide that we're seeing. And at the same time, there's this real call for a lot of nuance and a lot of, I guess, bids for validation to really be seen folks who have not been represented in other ways before. And It feels like an interesting thing for me to watch, especially I feel like younger people, people maybe in their 20s, like Gen Z, sort of grapple with how to ask for what they need and also continue to be flexible in boundaries. I see a lot of rigidity sort of popping up in the way that people are like, well, this is what I need and this is the only way that I can get it. And if you're not going to give it to me, fuck you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's not going to be very relational, right? That's not going to necessarily work in the long run. Does that spark anything for you? Does that resonate at all? What it makes me think and like, I think working with folks who are traumatized, of course, there's just so much need for hypervigilance that comes from our kind of like animal, like lizard brain protective instinct, right? It's like that thing. Like if I don't know that you're safe, you're not safe. And if I don't know that you're good, you're bad. And, you know, while that I think adaptive coping for survival, like as you said, it, it makes it really hard to be in connection and to be in relationship. And so I think often when that shows up in my work therapeutically, 
I think I just try to let it live there in a way, right? Like mm-hmm. try to let that reality really exist. Mm-hmm. And that can be really tough work, right? Of course, it doesn't feel good to like be perceived as a bad or a danger, but I also right. really get it. I've experienced that like on the other side of the couch, quote unquote. And I think, mm-hmm. well, why is that coming up more in recent generations? And I think in a way, like, I don't know, I feel like my generation just dissociated our way through so much because we didn't have language and we didn't have spaces to process it and right so like if you're traumatized and you don't have a place to go I feel like dissociation kind of is the place to go but then Mm -hmm. now I think I am seeing folks who are really like standing up and like saying something which I think is so powerful yeah but also can create distance again and so I think often it's like that kind of close nuanced slow work and like sort of dealing with almost like for both people to tolerate the right the intensity of those feelings coming up for both people, you know, and kind of being able to stay with it and find ways of connecting through it until a point where maybe that feeling lessens a little bit and there's some greater sense of trust. I feel like honesty to me feels like a big part of that work, like kind of like mm-hmm. how radically honest and transparent can I be so that you really see who I am as your therapist. Yes. Right. That I'm not hiding. And I think that that's also something so different. Like I think most of the therapists we all had were folks who were trained much more classically, like Freudian, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. therapy. I remember one time an old supervisor of mine said, you know, the therapist is like a brick wall that you bounce the ball off of. And I was like, what a lonely therapy that must be like. Yes. And also what a lie, like for a person to tell you I'm a wall. It's like, well, no, you're not. You're a person. So, right. Right. Like you bring your own bias and judgment and all of it with you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me has been kind of like an interesting part of the work, living with that fear place and the vigilance and rigidity and rejection and judgment that come with it in a way I think that's like a very common starting place for doing work with somebody who has had their boundaries violated who has been traumatized yeah what you're talking about with trust I'm thinking how healing that is from an attachment perspective when a client really allows their therapist to work through something between them in a slow, intentional, and like you said, transparent way, I think that's got to be one of the most healing experiences for clients. And I'm for, for me too. <laughs> Absolutely. On the other end of the couch. And it takes such a commitment to a deep level from a therapist perspective, right? A deep level of self-knowing and enough ego strength to be able to tolerate having screwed up or whatever projections might be coming from the client, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like that's also where the like, how we're doing our own work is so vital. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard. I come from a place where I was told I was bad or not enough a lot. So hearing that in a therapeutic session is not like easy breezy. Oh, well, this is just my job and I can just walk away from it. But I think infusing and like using my experiences of like, oh, I know what that dynamic is. And I really feel it in my body and to like name it, to work with it. And, you know, I think just like giving it a space to be honestly in my mind so often, I feel like that really diffuses that intensity. Right, right. Not overnight, but I think I actually sometimes see like a client who might start off in like the most intense of that space. Actually, that says nothing about how quickly the work can move, in my opinion. It's just yeah. where they're at in that moment in time based on every moment they've had up until that point. Right. I'm also a professor and <laughs> I... uh I I was just telling my friend last night, it will never not devastate me when one of my students like hates me and like (laughs) can't can't pick it up. And it's a similar process. Most of my clients generally like me because that's why they're coming to me. But I'm an acquired taste for some. And uh, it's really it's painful for me. It's like you're not seeing my humanity and all that I'm attempting to create and give and share. It's a rejection of self for sure. Absolutely. And then, yeah, it is. And then I get, I think like the place I try to like, let it be with me is to think how wonderful is it to be able to give someone the gift of 
rejecting them and the other person not agreeing to be rejected. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> Say more. <laughs> Which isn't like I have no boundaries, beat me up, but it's like, okay, you're like really angry. That's yeah. real. You can be angry and you can let me know how much I've failed you. And maybe if I let you tell me that and let that live, that there can actually be some restoration in that process. Because I think so often, I mean, you were talking about attachment mm-hmm. before. I mean, I feel like in a way therapy just is all attachment work, you know, whether or not yeah. that's the lens through which you specifically look. I mean, it is one that I've found really useful. Like, I feel like I use a lot of attachment-based practices and narrative therapy, but I just think so much of our work is that. And so when I think about, well, why do people come to therapy? Why do people seek a person with whom to engage in this form of like more structured paid right relationship professional relationship and I think almost only as it boils down to I didn't have the attachment figures I needed to be allowed to exist as a whole person Mm -hmm. like with whatever it is my anger or my shame my grief I wonder how many of us did have that I had a she was a psychic not even a therapist but a psychic once was like three percent of families are healthy and provide what they need for their children and i want to hope that that's going to get better given that we have a culture that's shifting more towards encouraging therapy Uh uh but there's still i mean there's still so many people who are just not interested in that level of personal growth you know i was thinking as you were saying that i was like do i believe it's three percent is it less is more and the answer is i'm not sure but something i've thought about a lot in recent years is This sort of idea of symbiosis, this like pre-birth time where we feel like totally connected in utero and like all of our needs are met without asking. And granted, that depends a great deal on like our gestational parents, like mental and physical well-being, right? There's a lot of reasons where that gets disrupted even before a birth. But something I've thought about a lot in my role as a therapist is like, there's something really powerful about like symbiotic loss and like the ways that we each reach to like feel that again, Mm -hmm. especially when we're feeling so disconnected from other people. And it's hard because like we can't recreate that. It wouldn't be possible, nor would it be sustainable. But I do think sometimes in those little moments when it's just like allowing that loop, that like closed loop to happen where like someone shares something they think that they can't say or can't share and it isn't rejected or it just gets to exist or gets responded to in a way that feels attuned. I think that in a way it's like us like kind of reaching for those symbiotic ways of like healing these sort of ruptures that feel really devastating in a life. You say it's not sustainable, but I guarantee you there's a billionaire out there who's going to try to recreate a womb situation. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Just so that it can happen. (laughs) TM, TM, TM. Someone like pay us to do it because we'll do it better. (laughs) There was some artists I saw once who knit these incredible like adult the size of a fetus style wounds. So I feel like we and that person should team up and we really have something amazing. Oh, let's do it. It's interesting, though, just like thinking my like American idealism, like pull yourself up by your bootstraps thing kicks in there. And I'm like, I don't want to get in that womb. I want to do it myself. (laughs) Well, and that's a part of it too, right? That it feels very vulnerable to be in that state. I think that's what I mean too about like the not sustainable part. It's like there's a lot of things that make that, it's like not possible to go back there. It's almost like the nurturance that in theory we get during that time where as children, if it goes well, when we miss that stuff, I feel like later that's what shows up in the room and those kind of situations you're describing, you know? Yes, to allow oneself to truly be cared for is one of the most intimate acts I think we can experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Fuck sex. Like it's it's just like allowing yourself to be loved. Yeah, it's a really powerful thing to be vulnerable enough to like show the parts of yourself that you believe are like the least lovable. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Deep sigh. Well, You talked about therapists doing their own self-work, and I know that you and Asher have created an offering that you're sharing for other therapists. And Asher talked about it, but I want to hear it from your perspective. So Kintsugi Therapist Collective is a little being and business that we started. And so what is it? I mean, I think like as we describe it on our website, you know, it's like a virtual community that's offering embodied care and support and wisdom and resources to trans and non-binary folks, to BIPOC folks, chronically ill and disabled folks, all of whom are care workers and mental health care providers. 
And I think really what it is, is, you know, Asher and I, as I mentioned, you know, we went to grad school together. We've known each other for years. We've been in one another's lives, our children's lives for so long. And for a really long time, I think Asher was the only other therapist I was in community with who like shared so many like aspects of kind of my life as like a chronically ill person parenting and there there's other things like there's all sorts of nuanced things inside of that and so during the pandemic we you know kind of we started like reconnecting and then my partner and I had gone out to western mass and we were able to see Asher and their family and we started just talking more closely about the feeling we were both having of like this shit is not sustainable anymore maybe being a therapist and a parent and a person living in a body that is like constantly breaking down and not working quite how we want it to like that wasn't that close to being sustainable before but like we kind of could make it work and now we can't make it work and maybe we don't want to have to make it work I think that was sort of a big part of it was like what happened to the liberation kind of idea like being like a social justice oriented healing justice oriented person and then being like wait I'm like really being harmed in ways the way that I'm working and like that's not okay and like isn't good modeling isn't also good for Mm -hmm, me and like mm -hmm. both of those things matter and so you know I think the way that Kintsugi Therapist Collective which we often call KTC was born was really this idea of like well what if therapists had a place to go to really be vulnerable with one another in the community and in connection because I think we both really just understand the ways that I think, especially living with illness and disability, you get so isolated and that it's so impossible to experience kind of like aliveness in isolation. And so I think that was sort of the idea. And then we kind of worked towards, well, what would be like a sustainable, generative, safe in the pandemic way to offer this? And here we are. And so, yeah, like right now we have two embodied private practice cohorts running, which are like small kind of intentional communities of clinicians who are meeting a couple of times a month synchronously and also have a bunch of asynchronous ways of connecting. And, you know, we share cases, but we also talk a lot about sort of the topics I feel like therapists often shy away from, like the parts of ourselves that feel really like disenchanted, disenfranchised, broken, um, like the name of the business, which Asher may have spoken to too. But Kintsugi is sort of a word that has come to mean a lot to me in my work in a sort of former lifetime when I was in my like art moment that, you know, part of me is like, what happened to that moment? I don't know. Somewhere when you, when you were like <laughs> becoming a therapist, I was like, what happened to that? I think in my life I was going to be like an artist and a writer who lived alone in like a studio mm. in New York city with like a lot of dogs <laughs> or something. And <laughs> yeah. instead I'm like a therapist yeah. in Philadelphia and I have a seven year old and I live in a house and like, you know, there's just a lot of things that didn't shake out mm-hmm. how I thought. But during that time I was studying ceramics and specifically interested because I'm Japanese in Japanese ceramic practices. And I got really interested in kintsugi, which is this idea of repairing broken pottery with lacquer that is infused with precious metals with the idea being like, instead of like in sort of like Western, and I would say in particular, like American culture, like the goal of fixing something that is broken, which we could say extends to a lot of things, but it's sort of this idea of you have to return something to how it began in order to hide the flaw. And this practice is the exact opposite of that. It's like to highlight the beauty of the brokenness and the repair, because then we understand that this object has really lived and this break is sort of like a part of its story rather than its end. And I think that for me is like what therapy is. You know, it's like finding ways to see and to hear and to accept and to really love the brokenness and to view those parts of ourselves as just intrinsic because we're all broken and that's not a bad thing, mm-hmm. actually. Um, right. We can be broken and whole at the same time. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. While Wounded Healers as Leaders is focused on group practice owners, Wounded Healer virtual groups are for individual mental health practitioners. I'll be offering our third round of Wounded Healer virtual groups starting February 2023. In our lifetime, it's never been more challenging to be a mental health professional. And as Wounded Healers, we are called to attend to our own recovery and transformation in order to support the healing of others. Just listen to what past participants have shared about what made this group special to them. The community, the individual members and the group as a whole, the dedicated intentional time to come together and connect in an authentic way. 
the group sharing and the chakra teachings, Sarah's humor and support, feeling less alone in some of the professional struggles I'm feeling, the community aspect. It's great to be with others in the industry and receive their feedback and support. Wounded Healers virtual groups will meet for eight weeks, Monday evenings on Zoom starting February 6, 2023. For pricing and information and to register, visit www.tinyurl.com slash woundedhealersvg-3. That's tinyurl.com slash woundedhealersvg-3. Well, this is a little bit of a specific question. Let's see. How do I say this? So I don't ask you to speak for all chronically disabled people, but what I'm very curious about is sustainability. Like you talked about, like, how do we do this? And at my practice, we have a therapist who is also disabled and we've been kind of racking our brains to figure out like, how do we maintain all the things that have to be maintained about the business and create space for the fact that this person cannot be productive all of the time, right? So I'm curious, maybe for you and maybe for other folks that you've worked with, what sort of workarounds and supports have been dreamed up for folks who don't have able bodies and whatnot to do what is quote unquote expected in, in the corporate worlds? It's a complicated question. And I think you kind of touched on it with this idea of production, right? Like when you do something professionally, there is such an emphasis on production. And there's a way in which, of course, there is, especially because of capitalism and the reality of the country we live in and the world we live in. But I also think some of it, I think, has been recognizing that like having and knowing one's limits do not like how I would describe it's like I feel like it's like a feeling I have more than like something I have words for but I think like maybe one of the ideas Asher and I kept coming back to is like actually like living with disability is just a condition of humanness like we all one day are going to face disability and we're all one day going to face death and just because some of us have been confronted by this much earlier in our lives this is something that we all live with and in a way and I'm sure you see this in your work like so many folks, like a big part of like the underpinning of what is going on for them is like, yeah, fear and denial of mortality. And so yeah, I think a part of KTC for us is also like, well, what if being disabled was a value and a virtue, not a flaw or something that takes away mm -hmm. from production, right? And like, what does that mean on so many levels? Like, what does it mean in terms of what a work day is, what does it mean in terms of money? What does it mean in terms of, you know, and I think for myself, something I realized is that therapy, even though our work is so much about like healing, growth, you know, all these things, it's also unfortunately often really extractive. When I was working in New York City in an agency, I was seeing like 30 plus clients a week. I mean, that was way too much. I mean, and never mind being chronically ill, it's like, how do you hold? that much. But even for folks in private practice, most people that I know feel like they have to really like full fill their days with client work. And that's just intaking vicarious trauma like all day, five days a week. Yeah. And so like I think part of for me was thinking about like, well, what really is a work week for somebody who does what I do in the body that I'm in, in the mind when I'm in? And then well, how do I think creatively about other ways to make money? Not to mention that because of the people I want to work with, I just can't and I won't charge some absurd full fee with no space. Right? Right. Like a lot, I think 50% of my practice are folks who are sliding scale. Like I do pro bono work. Like all of those things are really important to me. Like there's no like pot of gold, right? Like having to find a way to sustain. And so I think for me, a lot of that has been diversifying what I do. Like I find actually, you know, today we're speaking off screen because I've been dealing with some migraines, which is a part of my lived experience. And something I realized is like, I want to be present on screen for my clients who I'm seeing virtually, most of whom I do see virtually, especially because of health related concerns with COVID. So, okay, well, if I can only be on screen a few hours a day, like what else can I do that's off screen? And like, how can I yeah. build around that? I mean, I think one of the hopes is that, you know, I mean, for now, I think KTC is largely like kind of a labor of love and not to say it generates no income, but I mean, it's going to take time, right? Because of the effort and labor put in to see a return. And also that Asher and I really want the space to stay accessible to folks. So like thinking about that, right. but, you know, the hope to like have that be a part of it, 
I teach, I do consultation. I really love supervising. And I think like, you know, just trying to find other pathways. I know several of my colleagues have like kind of upped their creative game in terms of like selling their creative work. That's something I think about all the time, like getting back to things that really bring pleasure. Um, And, you know, my work brings pleasure to me too, actually. Like I really do love what I do, but I think I'm realizing that to really sustainably and ethically be a therapist, especially with the kind of work that I want to do, I just can't look at it like a nine to five job, right? I have to look at it like these are individual relationships, like the same way, like, you know, when you're thinking about the number of friends you have, or if you're somebody who's polyamorous, the way you think about, well, how many folks in my life can I really show attention and attunement to? And there's a limit to that, right? Mm -hmm. There just is. And I think that that knowing oneself in those ways is like so critical to be able to do this work. You're like offering a kind of relationship to other people and like how many people can you sustain and I think and how many of those relationships can you sustain and I think that's been a really helpful kind of thinking about it through like an ethical polyamory lens actually has helped me a lot and think about like right that's a brilliant yes it's not like there's an absence of care but there is an absence of time of energy of capacity and to like know those things and then to think okay well what else can I do outside of these like relationships that are so meaningful to me and I think KTC is a part of that in a way. It's like using a different part of my brain. A lot of KTC work is behind the scenes. I can do a lot of it from bed, which has been huge. I think most, I think chronically ill and disabled folks I know would say the more you can do from bed, the better. (laughs) Yes. Asher and I presented at a training recently for chronically ill and disabled therapists. And we did our presentation from bed, which felt incredible. I've never felt comfortable to do that. But I do think, you know, like pandemic has maybe emboldened some non chronic wheel folks to like wear sweatpants to work, like to, you know, just be comfortable in yourself and in your space. And I think those were lessons I kind of was forced to learn because of my physical condition earlier on in my career. But I think feeling more empowered in it now has been like really revelatory and feeling good in this work. Mm. Thank you for all of that. And talking about diversifying, essentially, like the ways that you not only generate income, but the way that you're allowing yourself to think about what really replenishes you. It's really inspiring. And I think so many people since the pandemic started have begun to recognize, oh, I have to have something else for my mental health. I can't just work all the time. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that that stuff, like, you know, we all say it, like we all pay lip service to like self-care, but I think self-care only has meaning if there's real care inside of it, right? Like going Mm. and getting one massage, like taking an hour to read a book for pleasure, like those things are nice. They feel good. But like that to me is not sustainable in and of itself, right? It's like a practice and it's like a commitment. And it's ironic because all of us as therapists, right, we encourage our clients to really be in commitment to self through therapy. And so many of us like run ourselves into the ground trying to like Mm -hmm. do all the things and support all the other folks. So I do feel like it's been kind of a reckoning to like turn that on myself a bit. Yeah. Well, and that sort of goes back to the objectification of therapists as helpers and caretakers. Not only is the expectation sometimes coming from the client, but oftentimes the expectation is coming from ourselves just based on what culture has decided a therapist is supposed to be. And most of us come to this from our own wounding, which (laughs) makes it very uh, easy to help others and not always as easy to help ourselves. Absolutely. For sure. Well, all of this begs the question, how do you feel about the term healer? That's the one question that you sent me before this that I really like honed in on. (laughs) And I think, you know, and maybe what we said about having a therapist for a parent, it's never neutral, that word, right? That word, I think, holds a lot of meaning. And I think what I came to as I thought about it and as we're talking now is I think that the word healing belongs for me in the world of talking about therapy But I also think for myself, at least, that for me, healing really happens in connection. So to call myself a healer feels too one-sided or like mono-focused. I think I'm a care provider. I think I'm a space holder. And I think like when we care in like the action and radical sense of that word and when we hold space, like through that and also through the presence and vulnerability and like reciprocal process of our clients that we're privileged to like work with and to know that is where healing becomes possible. So Mm -hmm. I think healing feels very connected to what I do. And I don't know that I would call myself a healer. Where is Libra in your chart? 
<laughs> um, you know, it's not really there so much. I have a Cancer and Scorpio stellium each, which oh, feels okay. like my whole chart is just like a watery vibe. Okay, so it's the water. That's okay. That's interesting because like everything you're saying is so relationship forward and that's how I view the world and I'm a Libra rising and I've just, I've started to really understand what that means and how that manifests in the day to day. So it's just curious. Yeah. Now I'm like, do I have any Libra in my chart? Do I? And since we're (laughs) on the phone, I'm going to pull it up. Please. My Pluto is Libra and that's the only part. Oh, interesting. And I don't know very much about it. My Pluto is in the 11th house. Which is like... Wait, what's the 11th house again? Isn't that like spirituality and stuff? Yeah, you know, that's, I feel like I'm a bad queer therapist right now because like, shit, I don't really remember. Well, it's so complicated. Astrology is a science in and of itself. And I think Pluto is the one also that only shifts like every generation, generation, right? So it's, I'm not special. Everyone within X number of years of me is also Libra. But yeah, no, I've got just so much water in my chart. I am also a Virgo moon, which I think as a therapist makes, and and if you know my aesthetic and way of being in the world, makes a lot of sense too. But yeah. Interesting. Pluto's in my first house, which is Libra. So yes. Okay. Are you like an elder millennial? Yes, I think that that is what I am. I was actually just saying to someone earlier that I feel like in the same way that Xenial is supposed to like bridge the divide by millennial and Gen Z, I think we need a term for like the Gen X millennial straddlers because I was like very late to the Uh technology game in part just because my parents were like not into it. Like I remember I got like a phone call home that was like, um, you need to give them a computer because they can't do their homework. And my parents were like, oh, okay. Wow. So like, I think I am a millennial. And also sometimes I feel like there's a lot of expectation in being a millennial to be like good at things like Zoom. And I'm just like so (laughs) bad at it in a (laughs) profound, like my clients are so kind in the ways that I fuck up those things all the time. But yeah, well, Xennial with an X is the term for our generational divide. I am the last of the Gen Xers. So I, of course, am like, I'm Gen X, like (laughs) wholeheartedly. But of course, yes, I did get the internet in 1996, like everyone else. And I was still in high school. So yeah. (laughs) Wow. Okay. See, see, I apparently didn't read like enough blog posts because I'm so bad at technology and the internet (laughs) that I did not even know what generation I was in. But thank you. I feel like I've learned something about myself in this exchange. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Happy to help. Well, on to the question about wounded healer. Does that strike you any differently? Yeah, if I'm going to be a healer, I'm certainly a wounded one for sure. And yeah, I mean, I think in a way, and maybe I was kind of getting at this with the discussion about Kintsugi too. I mean, I just think all people are wounded. I think it's just intrinsic to being alive. And I think like wounding just happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. And I certainly walk through the world, I think, with a lot of my wounds really showing some, which sometimes feels super vulnerable and maybe not what I would wish. But yeah, I do think being a wounded person and maybe maybe what I would say also is like being in touch with being a wounded person as a therapist feels like really important to me because I think so often like the harm created happens when a wounded person has not received the care that they've needed for their wounds. And then in turn, this whole relational piece, they enact those wounds onto their children, their mm-hmm. friends, their partners, their clients. Their clients yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I was approached by, uh, I won't name the organization to do a presentation. Like I do this wounded healer presentation. It's all about self-care from like a micro mezzo macro perspective. And my intro to it is that we all come into this from a place of wounding, trauma, addiction, whatever. And the comment that they gave back to me, like wanting me to like edit it and make it for their platform was like, well, not all therapists do. And I'm like, if you don't believe that you do, you shouldn't be taking this workshop, then it's not for you. And I feel really like I'm going to stick to, I don't want to use, I really don't want to use gun metaphors, but I realize how many fucking gun metaphors there are. Cause I wanted to say, stick to my guns. What do I even say? Like, I guess like dig my heels in, right. I want to dig my heels in on that. Because that is the lens through which I see the world that everyone has been traumatized, everyone has been wounded, everyone has been harmed. And the more that we're able to recognize and allow ourselves to come to, I guess, acceptance with that, then we're able to transform. I think like sort of like radical acceptance for me feels really key to like being a human who is 
on some level okay when like how are any of us really okay right now these days but to like find a place to be grounded and it's also like that relationship we have with ourselves if we overlook that and then we're in the business of relationship I kind of question like what we're doing exactly in the first place so yeah I'm glad you dug your heels and that feels like a good move yeah the gun metaphors really are so so many unfortunately I know right I've kind of been thinking about like I'm watching people that I know well catapult their careers into a place where they're doing a lot of media and a lot of people writing books for these publishers and I think like what I have to say is not for a commercial audience Mm -hmm. (laughs) like Mm -hmm. It is not for everyone. And I not take pride in that in a sort of like, oh, I'm unique. Meh, but like, I don't want to speak to everyone. I really want to talk to therapists who consider themselves wounded healers and just have our own cute little clique where we're trying to heal and learning astrology together, you know? <laughs> totally. Yeah. I often say that with clients too. Like, you know, mm-hmm. no one's for everyone. And like, that's not a bad thing, but it is important right. to like tap into who you're for and who's for you. Right. You know, so that we can be in relationships that are fulfilling. Right. And I think about that when it comes to equity, too. And it gets really tricky because not every space is for everyone. And yet we need to make more spaces for people who don't fit in (laughs) all of the like, I guess, um, like dominant culture spaces. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I've been grappling a lot lately with the things that are opposites and all the dialectics, right? The things that don't necessarily fit together. And yet we're trying to figure out how to make it all fit together. No, for sure. And I mean, I think maybe the answer in some ways is just let it be messy. Like, it's okay. You know, like, Mm -hmm. I think that that's like, you know, when you were saying before this thing about how much pressure we put on ourselves to get it right. More and more, as I kind of settle into this career, I feel like I'm just going to get it wrong a lot. Yeah. And like, that's fine. Actually, I don't think the wounding comes from getting it wrong. Mm-hmm. The wounding comes from not being attuned to what's happened yes. and not, you know, not staying with it, not being diligent and not being compassionate or just like owning it and having humility, being like, oh, I fucked up. Yeah, I got to figure out why that happened. And I got to, you know, come back to it with thoughtfulness and attention. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we've talked about a lot. We're coming to the end of the hour, but we still have a little more time. And I'm curious if there's anything that we've talked about that you want to expand on or anything that we haven't talked about that you're like, I really want to say this to the people today. I think right now, like the thing I'm feeling really excited about is some of the work that we're offering. We have a weekend intensive coming up that maybe I'll talk about for a minute while I have this platform. So Asher and I, we've been running these cohorts. We're actually enrolling for our third one, which is going to start in the spring of 2023. But we decided for folks who aren't quite ready or not quite needing to commit to a full year program, but who want to do this work. And I think for us, a lot of it is also just building community um, and increasing connectedness through this platform we're building. So we're having a weekend intensive in December called Mending with Gold. There's a lot of information about it on our website. And You know, I think the aim of this program is to be like a support space for care workers to reconnect with the core of why we're doing this work. Um, A lot of what you and I have talked about today is really aligned with what we're going to be talking about there, like addressing psychic burden, revisioning sustainability and enlivening practice and all of these things. So that speaks to folks. I feel like that's like this is a good place to, to say that. And yeah. If anything, I think the thing that I'm finding, I've been supervising a lot the last two years and I'm really loving that work. And I think something, if there's like a thing I feel like I want folks who I supervise or I consult with to like take away is it's just like, just be yourself in your work. I feel like I think back to the like one, two, three years post masters onyx, like walking into session in the heat of New York City summer with my sleeves rolled all the way down because I was trying to hide my tattoos wearing a like Mm. gender fucked confused outfit because I didn't feel like I could be in my gender at work and just feeling so disconnected from myself because I was like this is how a professional behaves let's pretend that I am like the white lady therapist that I've had my entire life and that just like Mm -hmm. never was gonna work and I felt so like uncomfortable and I also think like I probably did harm or I know I did you know to like model for clients that what you should do is fit yourself into a box that was not made for you. And so I think maybe if anything, as I'm like thinking about all of this and this idea of wounding and healing, and I think so much of it for me is really just about that. It's just like recognizing that like 
however and whoever and in all of the brokenness and in all of the imperfection that like that actually is the healing right offering that is it and i think it took me a really long time to believe that that could be true never mind to like say it out loud to an audience so i don't even know how many people will hear this but i think that i'm feeling really clear about that and maybe in some ways the despair of these last years has gotten me to like a radical place of like well i don't fucking care because this was the time we've got and like here it is, you know? Beautiful. And I mean, you're really speaking right to our audience's heart. I mean, I've gotten so much feedback from people who either early in their career or wanted to be therapists, but thought they were too fucked up to do it. And so what you're saying is, yes, be with yourself and you get to determine what sort of therapist that you want to be. I mean, obviously we have rules, guidelines, you know, don't fuck your clients, basically like don't fuck your clients. Have good boundaries. <laughs> There's a few rules, but I think the rules that there are are pretty easy to abide by and still be yourself. Yes. But I think they get turned upon us, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, so many people come to me and they're like petrified. They're like, I'm mentally ill. Do I need to like hide that from my clients? And I was like, that mm -mm. just sounds like it's going to be really hard to do. And what is the message that they're going to receive? That it's bad to be mentally ill? Right. Like, well, fuck, you're a mental health care provider. You're basically telling all your clients that you think they're bad, right? Like, so... You know, it is, but it's such a scary thing. And I think it's like, yeah, holding the tension between like who we think we're supposed to be, who we think is like a safe person to be in the world that we live in and then like who we actually are and like how mm -hmm. to, you know, how to pull those two things kind of apart. I just want to give you kudos for being that model that, you know, there's a therapist out there who shares similar identities with you, who thinks that they can't be themselves right now. And so thank you for being that model. And being willing to step out in some way, stick our neck out, you know, for authenticity. My like cancer and self is just like climbing inside of my shell. But thank you for saying that. <laughs> I like saw it. I saw it. Even yeah. though I can't see you. <laughs> Well, Onyx, this has just been absolutely lovely. I'm so glad that Asher sent me an email and wanted us to connect because this has just been wonderful. And I hope that this is not the last conversation that we have. I hope so, too. It's been a pleasure to connect today. And yeah, you know, Asher, you know, it, it was not an easy, you know, I think I'm a hard sell with like being in public, but I really I think like the mission of what you're doing is so critical and for all the same reasons of what you just said, right? Just to like provide a platform for folks to be broken and whole at the same time. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much to Onyx for being an amazing guest today. To learn more about Onyx, you can visit our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Thanks as always to Andrea Clunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme.